स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया So last time we talked about uh, generators and relations for the symmetric group S3. Now more generally, what if we had the symmetric group S n, where n can be any number, two or more. Now uh, this is just a slight difference. So here's the theorem. So let n greater than or equal to two. So I want to give generators and relations. So let n greater than equal to 2, then Sn, the symmetric group, is isomorphic to the free group on n minus 1 generators. Okay, so let me give them a name now a1, a2, a n minus 1. So there are n minus 1 in all, and modulo the normal subgroup n generated by where n equals the normal subgroup generated by a short list of relations. So, what are the relations we need by the following elements? First, a i square. Okay, so, this is like the a square and the b square that we had in the case of SL3. So, this is a i square for i between 1 and n. Okay, so, this is one set of elements I need. Uh, the second collection of elements I need are like the a b whole cubed that we had in the case of S L 3. So, that is the following I take each generator a i and multiply it with sort of its adjacent generator the next one a i plus 1. So, I look at a i a i plus 1 cubed. Now, here i can go from sorry here it can go till n minus 1 here it can go until n minus 2. Okay, So, this is a second sort of element I need uh, in the kernel and the third sort which we did not have in the case of S3 because it is too small, but uh, here we will have it in general is elements of the following form. So, let us take any a i and multiply it by a j and take the square of this element. Now, what are i and j here? j cannot be i plus 1. Okay, So, j has to be greater than i, but sort of farther than just one step apart. Okay, So, it is two steps or more from i. So, here we say that uh, i and j, well, let us say i and j are firstly between 1 and n minus 1, but j is at least i plus 2. So, this is the third collection of uh, elements you need and well between them they together they they give you a collection of relations. So, they give you a set of elements on the normal subgroup generated by this set is exactly going to be the kernel of, of the, the map from the free group to this. Okay, So, let me uh, so, to give you an indication of the proof which is almost along the same lines as for S3. So, the first thing is from the free group. So, let f denote the free group on these n minus 1 generators. From the free group, we can define a map, a homomorphism to Sn as follows. It takes, so this is a homomorphism pi like in the case of S3 a1 maps to 1, 2, a2 maps to 2, 3 and so on till a n minus 1 maps to the generator n minus 1 n. Okay, and as before this, uh, this defines um, uh, a homomorphism by the universal property of, of free groups. It is enough to specify it on these elements a1, a2, a n minus 1. Okay, but the fact that you are mapping it to these transpositions implies in particular, so observe that just like in the case of uh, S3 that each a i square is going to map under pi 
to the square of this transposition i i plus 1 okay and a transposition of course has order 2 okay so each a i square maps to the identity so a i square is in the kernel if i take a pair of consecutive elements a i a i plus 1 uh, where does it map well it maps to the product of uh, these two consecutive transpositions but that's just a three cycle i i plus 1 i plus 2 whose cube is identity so therefore this cubed is just the cube of this product which is again the identity okay so thus far it's like the the computation for s3 and now comes the new uh, ingredient if i take ai and aj two generators which are far apart meaning not just one step apart but at least two steps apart then their product maps to well what does it map to it maps to i i plus 1 times j j plus 1 but these are now two disjoint transpositions okay there, they have no elements in common because j is not i plus 1 it's greater than i plus 2 greater than or equal to i plus 2 so this is like a product of two disjoint transpositions and this element still has order 2. So if you take the square of this, it is just going to give me the identity again. Okay. So that is where we, we got those, those uh, relations. So a i square is surely in the kernel, a i a plus 1 cubed is in the kernel and a i a j square is in the kernel. This is for j at least i plus 2. Okay, so we know for sure that the the subgroup n that we wrote out, the normal subgroup generated by these these elements, that is surely contained in the kernel. So what we know is that this normal subgroup n, like in the case of SL3, is contained in the kernel of pi. And again, one sort of proceeds in the same fashion as before. You know that f modulo the kernel is well. There is an isomorphism to the group Sn. And since n is contained in the kernel from f modulo n to this, I have a surjection, okay, just the usual, the same maps that we wrote out before, g n maps to g kernel pi maps to pi of g, okay. So you have these, these maps and to prove that n equals kernel pi is the same as showing that this, this whole composite map is, is an isomorphism. So, if we can take this composition here and show that this composite map is an isomorphism, then we are done. Okay? So, that is what we, are, we still have to prove and uh, to prove that, so need to prove that this green arrow, so this green arrow is an isomorphism, that is the claim. Okay. And to prove that, I mean the proof is still indirect like before, which is we show that f by n has at most the number of elements in, in Sn. So claim uh, the proof proceeds via a counting argument, we show that this can have at most n factorial elements and recall that is the cardinality of Sn. Once you show this, because there is a surjection, it has to have at least n factorial elements. And the claim now, so the claim, further claim is to say it has at, at most n factorial elements. So together it will show that it has exactly n factorial elements and then you know you proceed like in the case of S3. Okay. So now I am sort of just going to indicate how, how to do this. Uh, you have to proceed as in the case of S3. So the proof proceed as in the S3 case as in the case of S3, okay, which is that you have to write out all the, the different possible cosets uh, of elements of this kind, look at W, N and write out what are the all the possible cosets. So, look at all this, W uh, is a word, any, any element of the free group and now you will have to count uh, the cosets and show that there can be at most n factorial of them. So, I would uh, sort of say the hint is uh, first do it for S4, do it for S4 and that will sort of tell you how to, how to do the general case and for S4 let me just tell you what is it that you have to prove. So, here I have three generators in the case of S4, 
So recall I had A1, A2, A3, these are the three generators. So maybe it's easier to let's just rename them as A, B and C in the case of S4. So what we had in the case of S3 was the following. We said look at the following six uh, cosets. So those, those very same cosets will also be required here A, N, B, N, C, N, sorry there is no C here, A, A, N, B, N, A, B, N, B, A, N and A, B, A, N. So these six cosets were what you needed in the case of S3. Now in the case of S4, we will need uh, 24 cosets. Okay. What are the 24? Well, these six certainly are there. In addition, we also need this uh, look at what I call CT, which is the very same six cosets with C multiplied on the left. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, same thing with so look at B C N and A B C N. Okay, this will again give me a list of six um, B C N sorry B C T I'm sorry T was my set of six cosets. So B C N then there was so you have A N look at B C A N dot 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 six of them A B C T again is I take A, B, C, N. So I had A, N. So I just put A, B, C, A, N dot dot dot. So I have 6 plus 6, 12 on this page and 12 on the earlier page. Show that these 24 cosets are all you need. Any other word that you write out in the A, B, and C will always reduce to one of these, these 24. Okay. And the way to do it is sort of also an, an inductive process only look at words which have A's and B's to start with okay? and that is like the S3 calculation which we have already done and now insert the C and now put the extra C in and see what happens. Okay? So I am going to leave this for you to explore and play with. So it is it's a, a very good exercise because it sort of gives you uh, some facility in working with free groups and so on. Okay, but let me now move on to uh, what is the application of, of this generators and relation procedure? So, here are some applications. Um, if you can realize a group by way of generators and relations, what it gives you is a way of constructing homomorphisms. That is the key, um, key use of having generators and relations. If I want to construct homomorphisms from my group Sn. Okay, Sn is the group which I now understand in terms of generators and relations. I can construct homomorphisms from Sn to any other group G. Okay. How do I construct them? Well, here is the, the proposition. So, I should say applications of, of the generators and relation procedure. It allows us to construct, uh, allows us to construct group homomorphisms from Sn to any other group. Okay. So, what is the, the procedure? How do you construct a group homomorphism? Well, here is what you need to do. You need to find n minus 1 elements in your group G, which sort of obey the same relations as the generators of Sn. Okay. So, let G1, G2, Gn minus 1 be elements of G satisfying the following properties that uh, G i square is the identity for all i between 1 and n minus 1. So, this is the identity of the group G. Now, G i, G i plus 1 whole cubed is the identity in the group G. This is for all i between 1 and n minus 2 and the third set of relations which is G i, G j whole square is the identity for all j at least i plus 2 okay, and between 1 and n minus 1. So, in other words, I find n minus 1 elements of my group G which satisfy the same relations in the group G that my uh, generators of Sn, Sn are supposed to satisfy. If I can do this, then I am guaranteed there exists a group homomorphism 
from Sn to my group G such that which sends uh, the, the corresponding elements of Sn. So, what elements? The elements sigma i to G i. Okay, where sigma i's are the, the transpositions, where sigma i is just i i plus 1. Okay, so, if you want to map the transpositions to any elements of the group G, those elements must satisfy the same relations that the transpositions do. And conversely, that is all you need. If you have that, then automatically there exists a well defined group homomorphism. Okay. So, let us prove this proof. Uh, where do we get this from? Well, from, from the we need to go to the free group to get this. Okay. We cannot just work with Sn itself to, to prove this fact. So, observe that uh, from my free group on n minus 1 generators. So, I had the free group f of a 1 a 2 a n minus 1. From that free group, I always have a map to g. Okay, what map is this? Uh, maybe we should call it something pi. This map just sends the generators a i to the elements, special elements g i okay, for all i from 1 to n minus 1. Uh, so, there exists a homomorphism, there exists a homomorphism like this. Why does it exist? Well, from the universal property of free groups, I can always specify arbitrarily where I want to map my a i's and that always defines a homomorphism. Okay, but recall that uh, the, the g i's satisfy those special relations. So, let n be the normal subgroup generated by those relations, normal subgroup generated by the set a i square a i a i plus 1 cubed a i a j square. So, here I am I am just suppressing the the, the bounds where I mean the ranges for i's and j's but I mean we have we have looked at this before. So, normal subgroup generated by that set of relations then observe that then observe that since g i satisfy the same relations it is clear that each of these generators then a i square will map to g i square but that is g i square is the identity okay? and so on a i a i plus 1 cubed will map to g i g i plus 1 cubed but then that was assumed to be the identity in the group. So, in other words, all these uh, these relations are actually satisfied in G. In other words, each of them lies in the kernel of this homomorphism pi. Okay, by the hypothesis, by the given hypothesis on the elements G i. Okay, now. Uh, we are almost back to our, our usual situation. So, what does this mean? So, I have now a map from uh, f by n to f by kernel pi and f by kernel pi by the first isomorphism theorem. This is isomorphic to the, the image of pi. The image of pi is some subgroup of my original group G. Okay, so, all this is just repeating the same arguments we did before. So, I can get a sequence of homomorphisms like this. This is just g n mapping to g kernel pi mapping to pi of g okay. and pi g is a subset of g. So, this is for all g in my free group f. Okay, so, I get this, this sequence of homomorphisms. Now, uh, what is it that we have? Well, we wanted to get a map from the symmetry group S n to G, okay. but observe that this f by n, so now comes our, our uh, the use of our theorem, this last guy f by n remember is exactly isomorphic to the symmetry group. right? From f by n, recall I actually have an isomorphism to S n. Okay, and what does this, this isomorphism do now? We just have to unravel what this isomorphism does. So, let me uh, write out this, this isomorphism just on those special elements. 
So, what was this uh, isomorphism doing? Well, if I take the special generator a i n, it was mapping it to those the, the transposition sigma i. Right? This is how we defined that map. How did we prove the isomorphism between f by n and s n? We defined a map from f to s n which takes a i to sigma i. Okay? And so, the coset a i n therefore was mapping to sigma i n just by the first isomorphism theorem. Okay, so, now we, we are all set because now we know what a i n goes to. It goes to a i kernel pi which in turn goes to pi of a i, but pi a i by definition was g i. Okay, so, we just have to stare hard at this equation. So, of course, this, this isomorphism is, is defined as going in this direction, but all I have to do is just think of the, the the reverse isomorphism. I just take the map from S n to this, which is the inverse of this map. So, this map sigma i maps to a i n, maps to a i kernel pi, maps to g i. In other words, what I have done is to show that I have constructed a homomorphism from S n to the group g and this homomorphism takes the element sigma i exactly to the given element g i. Okay, and that is that is what we set out to prove that finishes the proof. So, if you give me g i s with the correct properties, then I can construct for you a homomorphism from the group S n to g, okay, which maps the, uh, the, the sigma i s to the element, uh, which maps the sigma i s to the elements g i. Okay. So, that is the, the crux of this, this proposition. So, uh, in particular, so here is one, one simple application of this. Uh, so, so here is a question, what are homomorphisms? So, find all group homomorphisms from the symmetry group S n to uh, what I will call C cross. So, this is just the set of non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. Uh, z is not 0, thought of as a group under multiplication. Okay, this forms a group because I have inverses and so on. So, the question is uh, what are all the group homomorphisms that you can define from S n to this group? Well, uh, let us think of it as an application of our earlier principle. So, what did we say? In order to define a group homomorphism from S n to, to C, um, C cross, what I need to do is give you elements. So, I, I know that I have these n minus 1 generators of S n and if I stipulate their images, so z 1, z 2, z n minus 1, if I tell you what, where they map, then uh, that sort of determines my homomorphism. So, we need uh, find all group homomorphisms is the same as saying find, so I am rewording the question, find all collections of z i 1 to n minus 1 of complex numbers, non-zero complex numbers satisfying the following relations that all z i squares are 1. So, 1 is the identity for the multiplication operation and z i z i plus 1 cubed is 1 and z i z j square is 1 for all j greater than or equal to i plus 2. Okay. So, these two problems are actually equivalent. It is it's enough to do this. So, so this thing that I wrote here is the same as the original question. Okay. That is the that is the beauty of this. So, just homomorphisms are just these n minus 1 tuples of special elements which satisfy the correct relations. Okay. Now, it is easy. We just have to find such complex numbers. So, observe z i square equals 1 for all i means of course, that what are the the conditions, we conclude z i can only be plus or minus 1 for all i. Okay. Now, if z i is say minus 1 for all i, so here are two cases either z i equals 1 plus 1 for all i 
Okay, that gives me one obvious homomorphism, which is that the identity homomorphism. Everything uh, maps to the identity. So this is this is a valid choice because sigma i maps to one for all i means the homomorphism from S n to C star is just every every permutation maps to one. Okay because I can write any permutation as a product of these simple transpositions and if every transposition maps to 1, then every element has to map to 1. So, that is case 1. Case 2, suppose z i is minus 1 for some i, just a single i, then I need to figure out what are my choices. Is this a valid choice of z i? Well, at the moment I only used one relation, I still have other relations which is z i z i plus 1 cubed is 1, z i z i z i z j square is 1 and so on. So, let us try and use the cube relation. So, let us look at z i z i plus 1. So, if, if i is not n minus 1, then uh, I, I will have something next to it, the next guy. So, observe z i z i plus 1 cubed is supposed to be 1. Well, what does that this mean? if z i is a minus 1 and the product cubed is 1, then the only way out and, and z i plus 1 is also a plus or minus 1, right. So, there is only one choice, both z i and z i plus 1 must have the same sign. Right? If they have opposite signs, their product is a minus 1. So, this means that z i and z i plus 1 have the same sign. In other words, since z i is, is minus 1, this means that uh, z i plus 1 also has to be minus 1. Okay. Likewise, so I can replace i by i minus 1 and conclude that z i minus 1 is also a minus 1 okay. because it is the adjacent guy, it is the previous guy. I can apply the same relation with i minus 1 in place of i okay. and, and we keep going. Since z i minus 1 is minus 1, the one before it which is adjacent to it must also be the same sign. Since z i plus 1 is minus 1, the one after it must also be the same sign and so on. So, on the one hand you keep going uh, forward and on the other hand you sort of keep going backward and this, this argument says as soon as one of the z i's is minus 1, everybody after it is minus 1 and everybody before it is minus 1. Okay. So, this finally implies that every single z i is, so z j has to be minus 1 for all j. Okay, so, this is the only other possible homomorphism and again what does this homomorphism look like at the level of the what does it do to the other elements of the symmetric group. So, if I take S n to, to C hash, so I have said sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma n minus 1, all the simple transpositions map to minus 1 that is what this homomorphism does. But what, what about the other elements? What if I take an arbitrary permutation in S n? Uh, what does it map to? Well, what am I supposed to do? I take that arbitrary element and I write it as a product of the simple transpositions. Okay, And this map phi is, well, what is it? Phi g is plus 1, well, it is it's always plus or minus 1, but it is plus 1 if uh, g is a product of an even number of transpositions. Of an even number of simple transpositions. Okay, these simple transpositions are just the sigma i's and it is minus 1 if well if this is an odd number of simple transpositions. Okay, and recall this is exactly the thing that you have seen before. This is the sign map, this is the sign of a permutation, which is if you write it as a product of um, transpositions whether you have an even or an odd number of them. Okay? So, what we have proved therefore, is that there are just two possible homomorphisms. So, the question was find all homomorphisms from S n to C star turns out there are exactly two of them okay, which is the identity which takes everybody to 1 and the other which takes everything to a minus 1.